Hello, this is uh, Miss Marshall, and I'm going to be reading to you part four of Brown Girl Dreaming, which is by Jacqueline Woodson. And we're going to be reading part four, which is called Deep in My Heart, I Do Believe. Here we go. Family. In the books, there's always a happy ever after. The ugly duckling grows into a, sh into a swan. Pinocchio becomes a boy. The witch gets chucked into the oven by Gretel. The selfish giant goes to heaven. Even Winnie the Pooh seems to always get his honey. Little Red Riding Hood's grandmother is freed from the belly of the wolf. When my sister reads to me, I wait for the moment when the story moves faster toward the happy ending that I know is coming. On the bus home from Greenville, I wake to the almost happy ending. My mother standing at the station, Roman in his stroller, his smile bright, his arms reaching for us. But we see the white hospital band like a bracelet on his wrist. Tomorrow he will return there. We are not all finally, we are not all finally and safely home. One place. For a long time, our little brother goes back and forth to the hospital, his body weak from the lead, his brain not doing what a brain is supposed to do. We don't understand why he's so small, has tubes coming from his arms, sleeps and sleeps when we visit him. But one day he comes home. The holes in the wall are covered over and left unpainted, his bed pulled away from temptation, nothing for him to peel away. He is four now, curls long gone, his dark brown hair straight as a bone, strange to us, but our little brother, the four of us again, in one place. Maria, late August now, home from Greenville and ready for what the last of the summer brings me. All the dreams this city holds, right outside, just step through the door and walk two doors down to where my new best friend Maria lives. Every morning I call up to her window, come outside, or she rings our bell, come outside. Her hair is crazy, crazily curling down past her back. The Spanish she speaks like a song. I am learning to sing. Mi amiga, Maria. Maria, my friend. How to listen, number three. What is your one dream, my friend Maria asks me. Your one wish come true. Tomboy. My sister Dell reads and reads and never learns to jump rope or, plays hand, or play handball against the factory wall in the corner. Never learns to sprint barefoot down the block to become the fastest girl on Madison Street. Doesn't learn to hide the belt or steal the bacon or kick the can, but I do. And because of this, Tomboy becomes my new name. My walk, my mother says, reminds her of my father. When I move long-legged and fast away from her, she remembers him. Game over. When my mother calls, Hope Dell Jackie inside, the game is over. No more reading beneath the streetlight for Dell. But for my brother and me, it's no more anything. No more steal the bacon, Coco Levio 123, Miss Lucy had a baby, spinning tops, double dutch. No more freeze tag, hide the belt, hot peas and butter. No more singing contests on the stoop. No more ice cream truck chasing. Wait, wait, ice cream man, my mother's gonna give me money. No more getting wet in the Johnny pump or standing with two fisted hands out in front of me, a dime hidden in one chanting, dumb school, dumb school, which hands it in. When my mother calls, Hope, Dell, Jackie, inside, we complain as we walk up the block in the twilight. Everyone else is allowed to stay outside till dark. Our friends standing in the moment, string halfway wrapped around a top, waiting to be tagged and unfrozen, searching for words to a song,
dripping from the Johnny pump, silent in the middle of Miss Lucy had a, the game is over for the evening, and we all can hear our friends. Aw, oh, man. Bummer. For real? This early? Dang it. Shoot. Your mama's mean. Early birds. Why is she going to mess up our plane like that? Jeez. Now the game's over. Lessons. My mother says, when mama tried to teach me to make collards and potato salad, I didn't want to learn. She opens the box of pancake mix, adds milk and eggs, stirs. I watch, grateful for the food we have now. Syrup waiting in the cabinet, bananas to slice on top. It's Saturday morning. Five days a week, she leaves us to work at an office in Brownsville. Saturday, we have her to ourselves all day long. Me and Kay didn't want to be inside cooking. She stirs the lumps from the batter, pours it into the buttered hissing pan. Wanted to be with our friends, running wild through Greenville. There was a man with a peach tree down the road. One day, Robert climbed over that fence, filled a bucket with peaches. Wouldn't share them with any of us, but he told us where the peach tree was. And that's where we wanted to be, sneaking peaches from that man's tree, throwing, excuse me, throwing the rotten ones at your uncle. Mama wanted us to learn to cook. Ask the boys, we said, and Mama knew that wasn't fair. Girls inside and boys going off to steal peaches. So she let all of us stay outside until supper time. And by then, she says, putting our breakfast on the table, it was too late. Trading places. When Maria's mother makes arroz con hab habichules y tostones, we trade dinners. If it's a school night, I'll run to Maria's house, a plate of my mother's baked chicken with Kraft mac and cheese, sometimes boxed cornbread, sometimes canned string beans, warm in my hands, ready for the first taste of Maria's mother's garlicky, garlicky rice and beans, crushed green bananas, fried and salted and warm. Maria will be waiting, her own plate covered in foil. Sometimes we sit side by side on her stoop, our traded plates in our laps. What are you guys eating? The neighborhood kids ask, but we never answer, too busy shoveling the food we love into our mouths. Your mother makes the best chicken, Maria says, the best cornbread, the best everything. Yeah, I say, I guess my grandma taught her something after all. Writing, number one. It's easier to make up stories than it is to write them down. When I speak, the words come pouring out of me. The story wakes up and walks all over the room, sits in a chair, crosses one leg over the other, says, let me introduce myself, then just starts going on and on. But as I bend over my composition notebook, only my name comes quickly, each letter neatly printed between the pale blue lines. Then white space and air and me wondering, how do I spell introduce? Trying again and again until there's nothing but pink bits of eraser and a hole now where a story should be. Late autumn. Miss Mosh, Miss Moshkovitz calls us one by one and says, Come up to the board and write your name. When it's my turn, I walk down the aisle from my seat in the back, write Jacqueline Woodson, the way I've done a hundred times, turn back toward my seat, proud as anything, of my name in white letters on the dusty blackboard. But Miss Moshkowitz stops me, says, in cursive too, please. But the Q in Jacqueline is too hard, so I write Jackie Woodson for the first time. Struggle only a little bit with the K. Is that what you want us to call you? I want to say, no, my name is Jacqueline, but I'm scared of that cursive Q. 
No, I may never be able to connect it to the C, to C and you. So I nod, even though I'm lying. The other Woodson. Even though so many people think my sister and I are twins, I'm the other Woodson, following behind her each year into the same classroom she had the year before. Each teacher smiles when they call my name. Woodson, they say, you must be Odella's sister. Then they nod slowly over and over again. Call me Odella. Say, I'm sorry. You look so much like her and she's so brilliant. Then wait for my brilliance to light up the, the classroom. Wait for my arm to fly into the air with every answer. Wait for my pencil to move quickly through the, e through the two easy math problems on the mimeograph sheet. Wait for me to stand before class, easily reading words, even high school students stumble over. And they keep waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting until one day they walk into the classroom, almost call me Odell, then stop. Remember that I am the other Woodson and begin searching for brilliance at another desk. Writing number two. On the radio, Sly and the Family Stone are singing Family Affair. The song turned up because it's my mother's favorite, the one she plays again and again. You can't leave because your heart is there, Sly sings, but you can't stay because you've been somewhere else. The song makes me think of Greenville and Brooklyn. The two worlds my heart lives in now. I'm writing the lyrics down. Excuse me. That is better. Let's see, where were we? The song makes me think of Greenville and Brooklyn, the two words my heart lives in now. I'm writing the lyrics down, trying to catch each, each word before it's gone. Then reading them back out loud to my mother. This is how I'm learning. Words come slow to me on the page until I memorize them, reading the same books over and over, copying lyrics to songs from records and TV commercials, the words settling into my brain, into my memory. Not everyone learns to read this way. Memory taking over when the rest of the brain stops working, but I do. Sly is singing the words over and over as though he is trying to convince me that this whole world is just a bunch of families like ours, going about their own family affairs. Stop daydreaming, my mother says. So I go back to writing down words that are songs and stories and whole new worlds tucking themselves into my memory. Birch Tree Poem. Before my teacher reads the poem, she has to explain. A birch, she says, is a kind of tree. Then magically she pulls a picture from her desk drawer and the tree is suddenly real to us. When I see birches bent to left and right, she begins, across the lines of straighter, darker trees, I like to think, and when she reads, her voice drops down so low and beautiful, some of us put our heads down our heads on our desk to keep the happy tears from flowing. Some boys been swinging them, but swinging doesn't bend them down to stay as ice storms do. And even though we've never seen an ice storm, we've seen a birch tree, so we can imagine everything we need to imagine. Forever and ever, infinity, amen. How to listen, number six. When I sit beneath the shade of my block's oak tree, the world disappears. 
Reading. I'm not my sister. Words from the books curl around each other, make little sense until I read them again and again, the story settling into memory. Too slow, the teacher says. Read faster. Too babyish, the teacher says. Read older. But I don't want to read faster or older or any way else that might make the story disappear too quickly from where it is settling inside my brain, slowly becoming a part of me. A story I will remember long after I've read it for the second, third, tenth, hundredth time. Stevie and me. Every morning, my mother takes us to the library around the corner. We are allowed to take out seven books each. On those days, no one complains that all I want are picture books. Those days, no one tells me to read faster, to read harder books, to read like Dell. No one is there to say, not that book, when I stop in front of the small paperback with a brown boy on the cover. Stevie, I read, one day my mama told me, you know you're going to have a little friend come stay with you. And I said, who is it? If someone had been fussing with me to read like my sister, I might have missed the picture book filled with brown people, more brown people than I've ever seen in a book before. The little boy's name was Stephen, but his mother kept calling him Stevie. My name is Robert, but my mama don't call me Robert T. If someone had taken that book out of my hand, said, you're too old for this, maybe I'd never have believed that someone who looked like me could be in the pages of a book. That someone who looked like me had a story. When I tell my family. When I tell my family I want to be a writer, they smile and say, We'll see you in the back. We see you in the backyard with your writing. They say, We hear you making up all those stories. And we used to write poems. And it's a good hobby. We'll see how quiet it keeps you. They say, Maybe you should be a teacher, a lawyer, do hair. I'll think about it, I say. And maybe all of us know this is just another one of my stories. Daddy Gunner. Saturday morning and Daddy Gunner's voice is on the other line, other end of the phone. We all grab for it. Let me speak to him. My turn. No, mine. Until Mama makes us stand in line. He coughs hard takes deep breaths. When he speaks, it's almost low as a whisper. How are my New York grandbabies, he wants to know. We're good, I say, holding tight to the phone, but my sister is already grabbing for it. Hope and even Roman, all of us, hungry for the sound of his faraway voice. Y'all know how much I love you? Infinity and back again, I say, the way I've said it a million times. And then... Daddy says to me, go on and add a little bit more to that. Hope on stage. Until the curtain comes up and he's standing there, 10 years old and alone, in the center of the PS 106 stage, no one knew my big brother could sing. He is dressed as a shepherd, his voice soft and low, more sure than any sound I've ever heard come out of him. My quiet big brother, who only speaks when asked, has little to say to any of us except when he's talking about science or comic books. Now has a voice that is circling the air, landing clear and sweet around us. Tingaleo, come little donkey come. Tingaleo, come little donkey come. My donkey walks, my donkey talks, my donkey eats with a knife and a fork. Oh, Tingaleo, come little donkey, come. Hope can sing, my sister says in wonder 
as my mother and the rest of the audience start to clap. Maybe, I am thinking, there is something hidden like this in all of us, a small gift from the universe waiting to be discovered. My big brother raises his arms, calling his donkey home. He is smiling as he sings, the music getting louder behind him. Tingaleo. And in the darkened auditorium, the light is only on hope. And it's hard to believe he has such a magic singing voice and even harder to believe his donkey is going to come running. Daddy this time. Greenville is different this summer. Roman is well and out back swinging hard. Somewhere between last summer and now, our daddy cemented the swing set down. Roman doesn't know the shaky days. Just this moment, his dark blue heads pointing toward the sky. His laughter and screams like wind through the screen door. Now my grandmother shushes him. Daddy's resting in the bedroom. The cover is pulled up to his chin. His thin body so much smaller than I remember it. Just a little tired, Daddy says to me when I tiptoe in with chicken soup sit on the edge of the bed and try to get him to take small sips. He struggles into sitting, lets me feed him small mouthfuls, but only a few are enough. Too tired to eat anymore. Then he closes his eyes. Outside, Roman laughs again, and the swing set whines with the weight of him. Maybe Hope is there pushing him into the air, or maybe it's Dell. The three of them would rather be outside. His room smells, my sister says, but I don't smell anything except the lotion I rub into my grandfather's hands. When the others aren't around, he whispers, you're my favorite, smiles and winks at me. You're going to be fine. You know that. Then he coughs hard and closes his eyes, his breath struggling to get into and out of his body. Most days I am in here with my grandfather holding his hand while he sleeps, fluffing pillows and telling him stories about my friends back home. When he asks, I speak to him in Spanish, the language that rolls off my tongue like I was born knowing it. Sometimes, my grandfather says, sing me something pretty. And when I sing to him, I'm not just left of the key or right of the tune. He says I sing beautifully. He says I am perfect. What everybody knows now. Even though the laws have changed, my grandmother still takes us to the back of the bus when we go downtown in the rain. It's easier, my grandmother says, than having white folks look at me like I'm dirt. But we aren't dirt, we are people paying the same fare as other people. When I say this to my grandmother, she nods, says, easier to stay where you belong. I look around and see the ones who walk straight to the back, see the ones who take a seat up front, daring anyone to make them move. And no, this is who I wanna be, not scared like that, brave like that. Still, my grandmother takes my hand downtown pulls me right past the restaurants that have to let us sit wherever we want now. No need in making trouble, she says. You all go back to New York City, but I have to live here. We walk straight past Woolworths without even looking in the windows because the one time my grandmother went in, went inside, they made her wait and wait, acted like I wasn't even there. It's hard not to see the moment my grandmother in her Sunday clothes, a hat with a flower pinned to it, neatly on her head, her patent leather purse perfectly clasped between her gloved hands, waiting quietly long past her turn. End of summer. Too fast the summer leaves us. We kiss our grandparents goodbye and my uncle Robert is there waiting to take us home again. When we hung our grand 
Sorry. When we hug our grandfather, his body is all bones and skin. But he is up now, sitting at the window, a blanket covering his thin shoulders. Soon, I'll get back to that garden, he says. But most days, all I want to do is lay down and rest. We wave again from the taxi that pulls out slow down the drive. Watch our grandmother, still waving, grow small behind us, and our grandfather in the window fade from sight. Far Rockaway. Robert only stays long enough for my mother to thank him for buying our tickets, for getting us home. He does a fancy turn on his heel, aims two pointer fingers at us, says, I'll catch up with all you later. We tell him that he has to come back soon. Remind him of all the stuff he's promised us. Trips to Coney Island and Palisades Amusement Park, a Chrissy doll with hair that grows, a Tonka toy, Gulliver's travels, candy. He says he won't forget, asks us if he's a man of his word, and everyone except my mother nods. Hard not to miss my mother's eyebrows, giving her baby brother a look, pressing her lips together. Once, in the middle of the night, two policemen knocked on our door asking for Robert Leon Irby but my uncle wasn't there. So now my mother takes a breath, says, stay safe, says, don't get into trouble out there, Robert. He gives her a hug, promises he won't, and then he's gone. Fresh air. When I get back to Brooklyn, Maria isn't there. She's gone upstate staying with a family, her mother tells me, that has a pool. Then her mother puts a plate of food in front of me, tells me how much she knows I love her rice and chicken. When Maria returns, she is tanned and wearing a new short set. Everything about her seems different. I stayed with white people, she tells me, rich white people. The air upstate is different. It doesn't smell like anything. She hands me a piece of bubble gum with bubble yum in bright letters. That is what they chew up there. The town was called Schenectady. All the rest of the summer, Maria and I buy only bubble yum. Blow huge bubbles while I make her tell me story after story about the white family in Schenectady. They keep saying I was poor and trying to give me stuff, Maria says. I had to keep telling them it's not poor where we live. Next summer, I say, you should just come down south. It's different there. And Maria promises she will. On the sidewalk, we draw hopscotch games that we play using chipped pieces of slate, chalk. Maria and Jackie, best friends forever. Whoever there is smooth stone. Write it so many times that it's hard to walk on our side of the street without looking down and seeing us there. P.S. 106 Haiku. Jacqueline Woodson. Excuse me. I'm finally in fourth grade. It's raining outside. Learning from Langston. I loved my friend. He went away from me. There's nothing more to say. The poem ends, soft as it began. I loved my friend. Langston Hughes. I love my friend and still do. When we play games, we laugh. I hope she never goes away from me because I love my friend. Jackie Woodson. The Selfish Giant. In the story of The Selfish Giant, a little boy hugs a giant who has never been hugged before. The giant falls in love with the boy, but then one day the boy disappears. When he returns, he has scars on his hands and feet, just like Jesus. The giant dies and goes to paradise. First time my teacher reads the story to the class, I cry all afternoon. 
and I'm still crying when my mother gets home from work that evening. She doesn't understand why I want to hear such a sad story again and again, but takes me to the library around the corner when I beg and helps me find the book to borrow, The Selfish Giant by Oscar Wilde. I read the story again and again. Like the giant, I too fall in love with the Jesus boy. There's something so sweet about him. I want to be his friend. Then one day my teacher asked me to come up front to read out loud, but I don't need to bring the book with me. The story of the selfish giant is in my head now, living there, remembered. Every afternoon as they were coming from school, the children used to go and play in the giant's garden, I tell the class, the whole story flowing out of me right up to the end when a boy says, these are the wounds of love. You let me play once in your garden. Today you shall come with me to my garden, which is paradise. How did you do that? My classmate asked. How do you memorize all those words? But I just shrug, not knowing what to say. How can I explain to anyone that stories are like air to me? I breathe them in and let them out over and over again. Brilliant, my teacher says, smiling. Jackie, that was absolutely beautiful. And I know now words are my tingaleo. Words are my brilliance. The butterfly, the butterfly poems. No one believes me when I tell them I'm writing a book about butterflies. Even though they see me with the Childcraft Encyclopedia heavy on my lap, open to the pages where the monarch, painted lady, giant swallowtail, and queen butterflies live. Even one called a buckeye. When I write the first words, wings of a butterfly whisper, no one believes a whole book could ever come from something as simple as butterflies that don't even, my brother says, live that long. But on paper, things can live forever. On paper, a butterfly never dies. Six minutes. The sisters in the kingdom hall get six minutes to be on stage in pairs or threes, but never alone. We have to write skits where we are visiting another sister or maybe a non-believer. Sometimes the play takes place at, the pretend kitchen, at their pretend kitchen table. And sometimes, excuse me, we're in their pretend living room. But in real life, we're just in folding chairs, sitting on the Kingdom Hall stage. The first time I have to give my talk, I ask if I can write it myself without anyone helping. There are horses and cows in my story, even though the main point is supposed to be the story of the resurrection. Say, for instance, I write, we have a cow and a horse that we love. Is death the end of life for those animals? When my mother reads those lines, she shakes her head. You're getting away from the topic, she says. You have to take the animals out of it. Get right to the point. Start with people. I don't know what I'm supposed to do with the fabulous, more interesting part of my story, where the horses and cows start speaking to me into each other. How, even though they are old and won't live much longer, they aren't afraid. You only have six minutes, my mother says, and no, you can't get up and walk across the stage to make your point. Your talk has to be given sitting down. So I start again, rewriting. Good afternoon, sister. I'm here to bring you some good news today. Did you know God's world is absolute? If we turn to John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, promising myself there'll come a time when I can use the rest of my story and stand when I tell it, and give myself my horses and my cows a whole lot more time than six minutes. First book. There are seven of them, haikus mostly, but rhyming ones too. Not enough for a real book until I cut each page into a small square, staple the squares together, write one poem on each page. Butterflies by Jacqueline Woodson on the front. The butterfly book complete. 
now. John's Bargain Store. Down Knickerbocker Avenue is where everyone on the block goes to shop. There's a pizzeria if you get hungry, 75 cents a slice. There's an ice cream shop where cones cost a quarter. There's Fabco Shoes Store and a beauty parlor, a Woolworths Five and Dime and a John's Bargain Store. For a long time, I don't put one foot inside Woolworths. They wouldn't let black people eat at their lunch counters in Greenville, I tell Maria. No way are they getting my money. So instead, Maria and I go to John's Bargain Store where three t-shirts three cost a dollar. We buy them in pale pink, yellow, and baby blue. Each night we make a plan. Wear your yellow one tomorrow, Maria says, and I'll wear mine. All year long, we dress alike, walking up and down Madison Street, waiting for someone to say, are you guys cousins? So we can smile and say, can't you tell from looking at us? New girl. Then one day a new girl moves in next door, tells us her name is Diana and becomes me and Maria's second best friend in the whole world. And even though Maria's mother knew Diana's mother in Puerto Rico, Maria promises that doesn't make Diana mas mejor amiga, a better friend. But some days when it's raining and mama won't let me go outside, I see them on the block, their fingers laced together heading around the corner to the bodega for candy. Those days, the world feels as gray and cold as it really is. And it's hard not to believe the new girl isn't mas mejor than me. Hard not to believe my days as Maria's best friend forever, and even amen, forever and ever, amen, are counted. Pastels and Pernil. When Maria's brother Carlos gets baptized, he's just a tiny baby in a white lace gown with so many $20 bills folded into fans pinned all over it that he looks like a green and white angel. Maria and I stand over his crib talking about all the candy we could buy with just one of those fans. But we know that God is watching and don't even dare touch the money. In the kitchen, there is Pernil roasting in the oven, the delicious smell filling the house. And Maria says, you should just eat a little bit, but I'm not allowed to eat pork. Instead, I wait for the pasteles to get passed around. Wait for the, uh, wait for the ones her mother has filled with chicken. For Jackie, me, a Hayata, wait for the moment when I can peel the paper away from the crushed plantain covered meat, break off small pieces with my hands and let the pastele melt in my mouth. My mother makes the best pasteles in Brooklyn, Maria says. And even though I've only eaten her mom's, I agree. Whenever there's the smell of pernil and pasteles on the block, we know there is a celebration going on. And tonight, the party is at Maria's house. The music is loud and the cake is big. And the pasteles that her mother has been making for three days are absolutely perfect. We take our food out to her stoop just as the grown-ups start dancing merengue. The women lifting their long dresses to show off their fast-moving feet. The men clapping and yelling, baila, baila, until the living room floor disappears. When I ask Maria where Diana says, why where Diana, let's try that again. When I ask Maria where Diana is, she says, they're coming later. This part is just for my family. She pulls the crisp skin away from the pernil, eats the pork shoulder with rice and beans, our plates balanced on our laps, tall glasses of Malta beside us. And for a long time, neither one of us says anything. Yeah, I say. This is only for Russ, the family. Curses. We are good kids, people tell my mother this all the time. Say, you have the most polite children. I've never heard a bad word from them. And it's true. We say please and thank you. 
We speak softly. We look adults in the eyes, ask, how are you? Bow our heads when we pray. We don't know how to curse. When we try to put bad words together, they sound strange, like new babies trying to talk and mixing up their sounds. At home, we aren't allowed words like stupid or dumb or jerk or darn. We aren't allowed to say, I hate or I could die or you make me sick. We're not allowed to roll our eyes or look away when my mother is speaking to us. Once my brother said, but, and wasn't allowed to play outside after school for a week. When we are with our friends and angry, we whisper, you stupid dummy. And our friends laughed, then spewed curses at us like bullets, bend their lips over the words like they were born speaking them. They coach us on, tell us to just say it, but we can't. Even when we try, the words get caught inside our throats as though our mother is standing there waiting, daring them to reach the air. Afros. When Robert comes over with his hair blown out into an Afro, I beg my mother for the same hairstyle. Everyone in the neighborhood has one and all the black people on Soul Train. Even Michael Jackson and his brothers are allowed to wear their hair this way. Even though she says no to me, my mama spends my mom spends a lot of Saturday morning in her bedroom mirror, picking her own hair into a huge black and beautiful dome, which is so completely 100% unfair. But she says, this is the difference between being a grown up and being a child. When she's not looking, I stick my tongue out at her. My sister catches me, says, and that's the difference between being a child and being a grown up like she's 20 years old, then rolls her eyes at me and goes back to reading. Graffiti. Your tag is your name written with spray paint, however you want it, wherever you want it to be. It doesn't even have to be your real name, like Loco, who lives on Woodbine Street. His real name is Orlando, but everyone calls him by his tag, so it's everywhere in Bushwick. Black and red letters and crazy eyes inside the O's. Excuse me. Some kids climb to the tops of buildings, hang over the edge, spray their names upside down from there. But me and Maria only know the ground, only know the factory on the corner with its newly painted bright pink wall. Only know the way my heart jumps as I press the button down, hear the hiss of paint, watch J A. C. Begin. Only know the sound of my uncle's voice, stopping me before my name is part of the history, like the ones on roofs and fire escapes and subway cars. I wish I could explain, wish I had the words to stop his anger, stop the force of him grabbing my hand. Wish I knew how to say, just let me write everywhere. But my uncle keeps asking over and over again, what's wrong with you? Have you lost your mind? Don't you know people get arrested for this? They're just words, I whisper. They're not trying to hurt anybody. Music. Each morning the radio comes on at seven o'clock. Sometimes Michael Jackson is singing that ABC is as easy as one, two, three or Sly and the Family Stone are thanking us for letting them be themselves. Sometimes it's slower music, the five stair steps, telling us things are going to get easier, or the Holly singing, he ain't heavy, he's my brother. So on we go. My mother lets us choose what music we want to listen to, as long as the word funk doesn't appear anywhere in the song. But the summer I'm 10, funk is in every single song that comes on the cool black radio stations. So our mother makes us listen to the white ones. All afternoon, corny people sing about Colorado and everything being beautiful, about how we've only just begun. My sister falls in love with the singers, but I sneak off to Maria's house. We're safe inside her bedroom with the pink shag carpet and bunk beds. We can comb our doll's hairs, our doll's hair, 
and sing along when the Ohio players say, he's the funkiest worm in the world. We can dance to the funky chicken, tell imaginary intruders to get the funk out, to, to get the funk out of our faces. Say the word so hard and so loud and so many times it becomes something different to us. Something so silly, we just laugh just thinking about it. Funky, funky, funky. We sing again and again until the word is just a sound, not connected to anything good or bad, right or wrong. Rikers Island. When the phone call comes in the middle of the night, it isn't to tell us someone has died. It's Robert calling from a prison called Rikers Island. Even from my half asleep pace, even from my half asleep place, I can hear my mother taking a heavy breath, whispering, I knew this was coming, Robert. I knew you weren't doing right. In the morning, we eat our cereal in silence as our mother tells us that our uncle won't be around for a while. When we ask where he's gone, she says, jail. When we ask why, she says, it doesn't matter, we love him. That's all we need to know and keep remembering. Robert walked the wide road, she says, and now he's paying for it. Witnesses believe there's a wide road and a narrow road. To be good in the eyes of God is to walk the narrow one, live a good clean life, pray, do what's right. On the wide road, there's every kind of bad thing anyone can imagine. I imagine my uncle doing his smooth dance steps down the wide road, smiling as the music plays loud. I imagine him laughing, pressing quarters into our palms, pulling presents for us from his bag, thick gold bracelet flashing at his wrist. Where'd you get this? My mother asked, her face tight. It doesn't matter, my uncle answered. Y'all know I love you. You doing the right thing, Robert? My mother wanted to know. Yes, my uncle said, I promise you. It rains all day. We sit around the house waiting for the sun to come out so we can go outside. Dell reads in the corner of our room. I pull out my beat up composition notebook, try to write another butterfly poem. Nothing comes. The page looks like day, looks like the day. Wrinkled and empty, no longer promising anyone anything. Moving upstate. From Rikers Island, my uncle is sent to a prison upstate we can visit. We don't know what he'll look like, how much he'll have changed. And because our mother warns us not to, I don't tell anyone he's in jail. When my friends ask, I say, he moved upstate. We're going to visit him soon. He lives in a big house, I say, with a big yard and everything. But the missing settles inside of me. Every time James Brown comes on radio, I see Robert dancing. Every time the commercial for the Chrissy doll comes on, I think how I almost got one. He's my favorite uncle, I say one afternoon. He's our only uncle, my sister says. Then goes back to reading. On the bus to Danamora. We board the bus when the sun is just kissing the sky. Darkness like a cape that we wear for hours, curled into it and back to sleep. From, sw from somewhere above us, the OJs are singing, telling people all over the world to join hands and start a love train. The song rocks me gently into and out of dreaming, and in the dream, a train filled with love goes on and on. And in the story that begins from the song, the bus is no longer a bus, and we're no longer going to Danamora. But there is food and laughter and the music. The girl telling the story is me, but not me at the same time, watching all of this, writing it down as fast as she can, singing along with the OJs, asking everyone to let this train keep on riding, riding on through. And it's the story of a whole train filled with love and how the people on it aren't in prison, but are free to dance and sing and hug their families whenever they want. 
On the bus, some of the people are sleeping. Others are staring out the window or talking softly. Even the children are quiet. Maybe each of them is thinking their own dream of daddies and uncles, brothers and cousins, one day being free to come on board. Please don't miss this train at the station because if you miss it, I feel sorry, sorry for you. Too good. The bus moves slow out of the city until we can see the mountains and above that so much blue sky, passing the mountains, passing the sea passing the heavens, that's soon where I will be. A song comes to me quickly, the words moving through my brain and out of my mouth in a whisper. But still my sister hears, asks who taught it to me. I just made it up, I say. No, you didn't, she says back. It's too good. Someone taught that to you. I don't say anything back. I just look out the window and smile. Too good, I'm thinking. The stuff I make up is too good. Dana Mora. At the gate of the prison, guards glare at us, then slowly allow us in. My big brother is afraid. He looks up at the barbed wire, puts his hands in his pockets. I know he wishes he was home with his chemistry set. I know he wants to be anywhere but here. Nothing but stone and a big building that goes so far up and so far back and forth that we can't see where the beginning is where it may end. Gray brick, small windows covered with wire. Who could see out from there, from here? The guards check our pockets, check our bags, make us walk through x-ray machines. My big brother holds out his arms, lets the guards pat him from shoulder to ankle, checking for anything he might be hiding. He is Hope Austin Woodson the second part of a long line of Woodsons, doctors and lawyers and teachers. But as quickly as that, he can become a number, like Robert Leon Irby is now. So many numbers across the pocket of his prison uniform that it's hard not to keep looking at them, waiting for them to morph into letters that spell out my uncle's name. Not Robert. When the guard brings our uncle to the waiting room that is filled with other families waiting, he is not Robert. His afro is gone now, shaved to a black shadow on his perfect skull. His eyebrows are thicker than I remember, dipping down in a newer, sadder way. Even when he smiles, opens his arms to hug all of us at once, the bit I catch of it before jumping into his hug is a half smile caught and trapped inside a newer, sadder uncle. Mountain Song. On the way home from visiting Robert, I watch the mountains move past me and slowly the mountain song starts coming again. The more, more words this time coming faster than I can sing them. Passing the mountains, passing the sea, passing the heavens waiting for me. Look at the mountains, such a beautiful sea, and there's a promise that heaven is filled with glory. I sing the song over and over again, quietly in the window pane, my forehead pressed against the cool glass. Tears coming fast now. The song makes me think of Robert and Daddy and Greenville and everything that feels far behind me now, everything that is going or already gone. I'm thinking, if I can hold on to the memory of this song, get home and write it down, then it will happen. I'll be a writer. I'll be able to hold on to each moment, each memory, everything. Poem on paper. When anyone in the family asks what I'm writing, I usually say nothing or a story or a poem. And only my mother says, just as long as you're not writing about our family. And I'm not. Well, not really. Up in the mountains, far from the sea, there's a place called Danamora. The men are not free. Daddy. 
It's early spring when my grandmother sends for us, warm enough to believe again that food will come from the newly thawed earth. This is the weather, my mother says, daddy loved to garden in. We arrive not long before my grandfather is about to take his last breaths, breathless ourselves from our first ride in an airplane. I want to tell him all about it, how loud it was when the plane lifted into the sky, each of us leaning toward the window, watching New York grow small and speckled beneath us, how the meals arrived on tiny trays, some kind of fish that none of us ate. I want to tell him how the stewardess gave us wings to pin on our blouses, pin, pin to our blouses and shirts and told mama we were beautiful and well behaved. But my grandfather is sleeping when we come to his bedside, opens his eyes only to smile, turns so that my grandmother can press ice cubes against his lips. Excuse me. Sorry about that. Let's try that again. I'm going to be at the top of page 277. My grandfather is sleeping when we come to his bedside, opens his eyes only to smile, turns so that my grandmother can press ice cubes against his lips. <laughs> Excuse me. She tells us he needs his rest now. That evening, he dies. On the day he is buried, my sister and I wear white dresses, the boys in white shirts and ties. We walk slowly through Nickeltown, a long parade of people who loved him, Hope, Dell, Roman, and me, leading it. This is how we bury our dead, a silent parade through the streets, showing the world our sadness. Others who knew my grandfather joining in on the walk, children waving, grown-ups dabbing at their eyes. Ashes to ashes, we say at the grave site. With each handful of dirt, we drop gently onto his lowering casket. We will see you in the by and by, we say. We will see you in the by and by. How to listen, number seven. Even the silence has a story to tell you. Just listen, listen. Okay, so that is the end of part four. And the next part I will read will be part five, Ready to Change the World. Have a good one.